Hey everybody, this is Seth Kniep, Kniep and Real, and this is... Josiah. Mr. Josiah, and we are here to talk to you today about how to hire the right person for your company. Even if you are a brand new entrepreneur, it doesn't matter, you're going to have to scale. And in order to scale, what I mean by that is in order to keep growing bigger, you have to do two things. You have to use software, that's his expertise, and you have to hire people. That's more my expertise, but we both help each other out. So he knows back end and tools, I know people, and together we make a really, really good business partners in a team. You're going to get to a point where you have to hire people in order to keep growing. That means you have to trust people, work with people, collaborate with people. And there's a big challenge to this. Because of the four main assets, people, time, knowledge, and money, people are the most wonderful, they're the most powerful, they're the most influential and helpful, but they're the, also the most challenging. Of all these four resources, people can hurt your company more than the other three combined. So keep that in mind. They help you a lot, but they also can cause you a lot of heartache, and that's why this process is so challenging. When you got a little problem and you don't know what to do And you're trying to figure out when you're feeling really blue Just talk to us and we'll help you in reason We're gonna show you how to hire the right person You got a problem, we'll be here on time We're gonna bring people into just one dime Yo, oh, we got to do this I know it's hard, but you cannot prove this If you don't ask all the right questions Then you will not have a problem with your sessions Ooh, let's go people, come on Okay, alright, how to hire the right person for your company Guys, at the end of this video, we're gonna show you some bonus tips, some things that people, employers, do not talk about like they should. Number two, below, we're gonna add a link where you can get the application we created custom for people applying for just one dime. And thank you to Typeform, who provided the template that we built off of. That was really, really helpful. Typeform.com, you guys are awesome. You're one of our favorite tools, and this is a shout out to you guys. We sent out an email a few weeks ago inviting people to work for just one dime. And some of the applicants we received were really impressive. Some of them work for Wall Street. They've been on, I mean, they've worked on Wall Street Journal for years. Some of them were doctors, some were lawyers. Some did war planning for the United States Air Force. I mean, the variety and the skills of the people who applied was kind of overwhelming, but we were really impressed too. Yeah. But we don't just hire someone because their skills are high. We also want to know what kind of people they are. We're gonna give you guys six steps, okay? Six steps, what we have learned about hiring people. Number one, decide what kind of person you want. This is extremely important. More than just filling a role, it's important that you find the right people. I just wanna be a part of it. I, it is so, so um, unconventional what you're trying to do, you know? The typical mindset is usually you just, you have a set amount of hours during the week. You go, you work, you have to save up for college tuitions and you have to save up for retirement, this and that. But then right. I feel like you get to miss out of life so much. Yeah. And it's, it's, it just takes up too much time. And this way, you know, with the flexibility that you have and with uh, just what you are going to do with this company, it's... Uh, I, I cannot think of a better place to be, honestly. Mm. <laughs> yes. So one of the concepts that Josiah and I went through is we said, we don't want to just fill a role. We want to hire a team. When we were in China, we ran into someone who was an incredible person, very honest, very high skills. We didn't have a position for her. But because she was such an incredible person, we offered to hire her and we hired her in a few days. And she's been working for us for over six months and it's been fantastic. We didn't even have a position yet. So think about it this way. If you want your company to go far, you need a really good team. All the way down to just administrative stuff. Don't underestimate the importance of a secretary or admin help or someone hands who handles various tasks. They're going to influence the future of your company. Step number two, create a filter system to narrow you down to the right person. You need a filter system. Filter number one is the invitation email or letter. You're inviting people to work for you. It may be a post on Craigslist. It could be an ad. It could be a physical letter mailed out. But when you send that email out, that letter needs to filter out people. It needs to scare off the wrong kind of people and attract the right kind of people. One mistake I think that a lot of new employers make, we've done this in the past, is making the position too attractive. 
Then you hire tons of people and you'll spend the next 13 years of your life going through applications, which is not a good use of the asset called time. So guys, when we send out the application, um, think about it as a funnel. So you send out an email for, you know, it could be for marketing, it could, it could just be for a lead magnet, it could be to get someone's email, or it could just be content. You send out an email, but the number of people who click on that email will be less than the number of people who open the email. So right. first there's opening the email, which is going to be a, probably a lot of people if they're interested in what you're offering. Big part. And then once the next step is they click on the link, there will be less people who click on the link. So the percentage drops. And then once they click on the link, it opens the form. And the people who actually start reading the form before leaving the page, that's going to be less too. So every step of the way, guys, is another filter. Yep. One of the filters that we had was just the welcome page because it explained all the things that we're looking for in a person for the application. So, you know, let's say the person was a developer, but it didn't say anything about coding. So that might have been why they left. Another reason, you know, it could just be they're not interested, so they leave. So the number of visits that we had on the page were way more than the number of people who actually applied. Another filter we had was the length of the ap actual application. It was around like, how many questions was it? Like 40 questions, right? is around like 40 questions and it, the average time it took to complete was over two hours. So we had 1,954 people went to the application. Of those who went to the application, only 96 filled it out. And of all the people who started the application, only 4.9% of them completed it. Right. Now that might sound bad, that's actually good. Because we knew by having the form f fairly long, and having big difficult questions, it would filter out the wrong kind of people. A couple things on this. So when we send out the invitation email, you do not want it to be too attractive. You will get 10,000 applicants and spend way too much time going through the applications. So what we did as our invitation is we said this. We said, we're looking for a badass warrior. Now, by saying that, it immediately filters out anyone who doesn't think they're badass. We want people who are confident. But to counterbalance that, we don't want people who are arrogant. So the next statement says, we want someone who is teachable and easy to work with. An arrogant person is not teachable and is not easy to work with. In fact, the word teachable scares some people because they get nervous. Wait, I don't want to be teachable. I know everything. And of course, people who think they know everything don't get anywhere in life. We don't want that to be part of our team. Right. Understand that the people you bring into your team are going to influence its future. It doesn't matter how lowly the position might be, they will influence your team. So be very careful who you bring. Ask yourself, do I want my team to look like that person? I'm not talking about physical looks. I'm talking about the personality, their attitude, how they handle conflict, all those kinds of things. The next thing we said on the invitation letter is we want someone who takes initiative. This is extremely important. If someone doesn't take initiative, we can't have someone who's just sitting there doing their tasks throughout the day and not getting it done. We need someone who will approach us proactively. We're too busy to hold someone's hand. We need them to proactively pursue it. The other thing we mentioned is this is a full-time position and requires flexible hours. It may require international travel. Being married and have ki having kids is okay, but if they're so tied down that they're geographically restricted to one location and we need them to fly with us to Guatemala or China, or United Kingdom or Costa Rica in order to do a video, to do coaching, training, whatever it is, to do an event to Los Angeles, that's not going to work. So we, you want to set your expectations up quickly at the beginning. Think of all the biggest obstacles, the kind of person they are, are they teachable or are they arrogant? Will they be able to do international travel if that's important? Put those at the beginning to filter out the people right. who won't work with. And guys, to go back to what Seth said before about people uh, hiring someone who is really needy and constantly asking us questions, we also don't want the opposite of that who, you know, takes initiative a lot, but at the same time they don't listen to us because they're so independent. We're looking for someone who takes initiative on their own but is also a follower to the leadership of the company. And that way it will save us time both ways. Yeah. And that takes a, that's a good point. That takes a very good balance to be a good leader and a good follower. It is some people they love leading, some people they love following, but to be actually be able to have both abilities is important. Uh, when they go to the application, the first thing they see, there are two things. What they need to do and what kind of person they are. So what they need to do gives a list of various tasks that they will be doing. And we tried to put in there a variety of tasks so that they're not thinking, oh, I can do that, but I can't do that. They need to see a real big variety so they're comfortable doing those tasks. It doesn't mean they have to be highly skilled in all of them. Some will have to be trained into, but we again, we want that to be a filter. Right. Second, we have a part that says, who are you? Like you, what kind of person are we looking for? This is equally important. 
Because if someone is extremely skilled, but has terrible work ethic or can't work with people or they're not teachable or they take personal offense when someone disagrees with them, they are not a good fit for your company. Step number three, read not only what they say, but how they say it. There are two ways to find out the kind of applicant who's applying for this position. One is what they verbally say about themselves. You're never gonna get 100% accuracy on that. Some of it will be accurate because people are somewhat honest or somewhat aware. They could be 100% honest, but not 100% aware, so only half of it is actually true. It's still gonna give you data. So asking someone, are you skilled at this, are you not? You can still trust what they say generally. But the second thing we do is we ask questions to see how do they respond to that question to understand that person better. And also, guys, there's two other things on a different side that we're looking for in a person. The first thing is their their actual skill level. So how good are they at certain using tools? How good are they at copy? How is their spelling? How fast do they type? Things like that. We're looking for very high skills. The other side is the character and the, the work ethic of the person. And actually that the, the second one, the work ethic and the character is more important to us yep. than the skills because think about two different people, for example. One has really high skills, but it's really hard to work with. There's another person who's really humble and easy to work with, but has less skills. We want the second person because you can grow with them and learn. Right. So it might take you know six months longer for them to get up to the skills of the other applicant, but once they're there, they're gonna go much further. We have hired people who had great skills, crappy attitudes. We've also hired people who had great attitudes, low skill. Mm -hmm. Hiring someone with a great attitude and low skill was far less frustrating, let me tell you. It yeah. still has its frustrations. Yeah. You're gonna have to have both for your position. Think about this too. Think about the time you're gonna spend investing in this person. You don't wanna invest in someone if you don't think there's a long-term opportunity for them to work with you. For example, the first question we asked on the application is tell us about a project you participated in that you were proud of. We got a variety of answers. Now the reason we asked this question is we want to see how much detail do they include in their answer that tells us how detailed they are because someone needs to be detail oriented to fill this position right. But second, we want to know what they would consider successful because what they consider successful may not be what we consider successful. One person said, I kid you not, I picked up the stapler that my coworker dropped on the floor. Okay, so that person we did not contact for an interview. Someone else said, I helped someone else in their department with sales and my boss was upset about it, but at least I was going above and beyond. We do not want someone working for us who is not doing the job we've given them, sacrificing their current responsibilities to help someone else. Someone else said an entire department was struggling and I influenced person by person to look at a new opportunity that they were afraid to do. I acted as a liaison between my boss and my subordinates. Even my boss didn't agree with me at first and she single-handedly influenced that entire department into succeeding, their profit increased over 100% in that quarter. They made over 1.2 million more dollars for the company in that three month period as a result. So they gave us tangible results. Mm -hmm. they, were they, were, they were detailed. They were detailed. They were in a very difficult situation acting mm -hmm. between the boss and the subordinates and they made it happen. So see the difference between picking up someone's stapler versus turning an entire division around and making it money, how they vary, how they value their success. Obviously this person had a much greater opportunity to work with our company. In all the questions of this application, we made them open-ended. When people answer them, they can't just say yes or no. It doesn't tell us anything about that person. Right. But when we leave an open-ended question, like tell us about a project you're proud of, then they can be super detailed or they can be super short and we can read, it's like a story. Do you think I'm cool? I wanna know. Exactly, that question. So we wouldn't ask answer the question. I don't know if you think they're cool. No, you're not cool, sorry. <laughs> How cool am I? Now that'd be a better question. Yeah, so we don't ask questions like that because it's just a yes or no, but when we ask open any questions. There are many endless possibilities. It's limitless the way uh, just one time can grow. Uh, it's true now that it's really focused on uh, Amazon and uh, it's it's amazing the, the value. But in the same time now it's growing to eBay and maybe in the future Walmart. And w the more the community is growing, the more we are having more people with more uh, skills. For example, people with trading, people with uh, Bitcoin, for example, knowledge. And we can uh, just grow all together and maybe you know, uh, invest w with this knowledge that we are having more and more in the group. So yeah, uh, it's, it's, it's amazing. The second question we asked in the application is what is the biggest professional mistake that you've made and how did you learn from it? 
the reason we ask this question, and by the way, this is pretty much the exact opposite of the last question. Yeah. Because it's not something they're proud of. It's something that they're ashamed of or, you know, they regretted, but they're telling us. Two reasons we ask this question. One, if they tell us, you know, a true mistake that's legit, then it allows us to trust them more. And it shows... It shows humility. Ego. It shows transparency. It shows a willingness to take ownership. One of the people, the way they responded was, I'm not comfortable with this question. I think it's inappropriate. Well, they made that easy. I don't think we interviewed him, did we? No. <laughs> Another person said, yeah, I made a mistake. And they talked a lot about the problem and how bad they felt, but they didn't say anything about what they learned from it. And a third person and several shared exactly what they did wrong. And they didn't demonstrate any sense of like ongoing guilt, but just like I messed up, but here's what I learned and what I've done with that. That was far more impressive. We need to know that the people are comfortable taking ownership. If someone can take ownership on a simple application, let me tell you in real life, you're gonna have a real problem because they're not going right. to take ownership when they mess up. In fact, they might be tempted to lie, cover it up, and then you find out about the problem when it's too late. Right, but the opposite is true. If people are willing to take ownership in an application, then that is very like that very likely means that they're they'll take ownership in real life in real um, situations. It seems a little cookie cutter, but the question about strengths and weaknesses is always a tough one for me because it's dynamic. It changes as I change, right. so I have to do a lot of introspection. And I'm glad it was one that I was able to type because I had to think. I had to think. What about me now needs work? And what about me now is at its peak. So I, that one is always a tough one for me. And it takes a lot of introspection, like I said, and bravery to tell someone you've never met what the worst thing about your work, or your work ethic is. Right. So that's, that's always my big one. The next question we asked right after the one that he mentioned, tell us about a professional mistake you made, was tell us about a time you messed up. Now this question may surprise you. The, why would we ask two similar questions? What's a professional mistake you made? Tell us about a time you messed up. Notice we removed the word professional. It's just about a time you messed up. What we did is we opened the gate for them to get a little more personal and share more. Now again, we got one of three answers. Number one, they wouldn't answer or they'd say, oh, I don't need to answer. Number two, they say, well, I already answered this question in the last question. Number three, they actually shared a different mistake that they made because they obviously don't have a problem being aware and self-conscious about the weaknesses of the areas they need to grow. That was huge. You see, the questions, we're not just trying to get the facts, we're trying to get to know them. What motivates them? How do they handle pressure? How do they handle failures? How do they handle success? Them being open and showing their weaknesses is actually a sign of strength. And that's one yes. of the reasons we ask this question. Step number four, ask open-ended questions. Josiah talked about this a minute ago. One of our questions we asked is how organized are you? How do you organize yourself? Now notice we didn't say, are you organized? Well, who's gonna say no? Show us how organized you are. Tell us, give us an example. This forced them to write out specifically how they're organized. And what was funny is if what they wrote was a very in a very unorganized fashion, they already answered the question for us. Even if the content of what they said was impressive, the way they did it was unorganized. So you're not just listening to what they're saying, you're looking at how they're saying it. And if someone can't organize themselves, they would die in this position. You have to be organized if you're gonna handle a bunch of data. Another question we asked is, what are the skills you hope to learn from working for Just One Dime? The reason we ask this is we want to know if this position is just a stepping stone to something else in the future, or if they actually are good for a company long-term. One of the reasons I started working for Apple February of 2011 is because I knew there was a lot I could learn from the company. When I started, the pay was very low. It was much lower than if I worked for Dell. I had to choose. There was an opportunity at Dell to make almost twice the money, then an opportunity to work at Apple. I like Apple computers. Sorry, Dell, I don't like your computers. And I like the, uh, the culture of Apple. So for me, there was a value there. It wasn't just money. I wanted to learn and grow and it became a very strong asset to the company and sometimes made more money for them in a day than they paid me in a year. I helped them make money. I trained a lot of their employees. That is the kind of thinking we want for our team. They're not just looking for, oh, this is a job to pay my bills so I can work on my private label store. And if you are working in a private label store, that's a benefit but it's also a company I want to learn and grow with. And that's why one of the next questions was, where do you see yourself five years from now? For me, my dream is to maybe in the future, 
um, have yeah more responsibilities, uh, be uh, to take courses for trainer for training, uh, for uh, uh, be able to to coach people uh, with time. Maybe I can do it. I will do it. So what we did is I thought okay as we're going through this, let's say Bobby McGee he applied. Did he apply? Um, I think he did. He did apply. That's cool. So you know maybe you get to see him after all. When he applied and we read his answer to that question, where do you see yourself five years from now? We can ask this question, is this the kind of person we wanna work with, five year future version of Bobby? Do we want him to be on our team? Right, and it shows us how they think of themselves five years from now, and it shows us what their goals are, because you know, there's some people who have goals you know, for the next 20 years, and there's some people who are just like, you know, just live life. Um, Impulsively, yeah. what comes in, what, what do I feel like doing right now? Right. One of the hardest questions we asked, and hardest not for us, but for them, was what annual salary are you looking for? I know how hard that question is because when I applied for jobs in the past before I became my own entrepreneur and working for myself, here's what's going through my mind. Hmm, if I ask for too much, they're gonna turn me down. If I ask for too little, I'm gonna regret it. But you know what's funny? When we looked at the answer to that question and it was required, you can set up your survey or your application online so that they can't go to the next question unless they answer it. We did not go like this. Hey, look at all the lowest. Let's go with these. We'll save money. That's stupid. Right. In fact, people who gave a very low number, we became concerned about ever hiring them because that means they may have a low view of their skills. On the other hand, for people who asked for a ridiculous amount and gave very little thought to the application, we didn't even consider it because they didn't even try very hard on the application. They expect a huge pay. We're like, right. I don't and want to work with someone like that. that. They're arrogant as well. Could, yeah. Asking yeah. for high pay is not wrong, but if there's high pay and no, and no effort. Show, and the, it did, they didn't show any high experience either. Right, the experience level is very low. So that's why asking for too much or too little could be an issue. So w the reason we asked the question was not so we know how much to pay them we asked it to get to know them and what kind of person they are. Now, obviously, if someone asks for a higher level of pay, then you go look at their experience and where they've worked and it makes sense, that makes sense. They should ask for more. And if you look at someone else who has extremely low ask and their experience is low, that makes sense. You have to look at the answer to that question in context of their abilities and skills, as well as in context of how much heart did they put into this application. Another part of the application, and this was within multiple questions, was we were looking for how people wanted to appear online and what their presence was online. Um, one example of the question was, what is your Facebook profile? Or give us a link to your Facebook and give us a link to your LinkedIn. So we would visit their Facebook profiles and LinkedIn profiles. We would look at different images and posts so that we can see how they interact with other people online and how they view themselves or how they want to appear online as well. Because online people, you can put whatever picture you want, you can position to make yourself look a certain way online. And that right. tells us what motivates them. Mm -hmm. So the way someone positions himself on Facebook doesn't necessarily tell you what they're like. It tells you what motivates them or the kinds of things that they share or comment on on their Facebook page. So guys, an example of this is one of the questions was, please, if, if you would like to, this wasn't required, but if you'd like to, please record a video of yourself just introducing yourself and saying hi. Right. And so... And we said, if you want for extra points, you can do a little dance. Exactly. We had a fun time, though, watching all those dances. They were hilarious. I'm telling you, we've yeah. never seen more styles of dances in one place in my life. Like, we would just sit down and just watch. It was awesome. <laughs> yeah, there's this one person who recorded a video, and it actually wasn't a video of himself talking to the camera. It was actually a video of him flirting with girls around, you know, Los Angeles. He had another guy behind a camera way, way back. And yeah. you could see him walking up, talking to girls. Right. Just random pretty girls. So what did that tell us about him? Do we want this kind of person on our team? He'd probably be flirting with all the girls, all the pretty ladies on our team. <laughs> so that told us a lot, that video. The other reason, the reason we asked, share a video of you dancing, okay? was because it would tell us, is this person comfortable in their skin? Was that a deal breaker? If you didn't submit a dance, does that mean you didn't get hired? No, not necessarily. But did it in definitely increase our respect? Absolutely, because it tells us you're comfortable in your skin. So if you, the traditional way for asking people for applications for jobs is wrong. It's too standard. Everyone has a resume and they all look the same. On paper. The most boring thing in the world is to read a resume after resume after resume after resume. 
could not stand it. And no offense to anyone who submitted it because they all look the same. It's just a bunch of data. I'm responsible. I'm teachable. I'm, well, then I don't think anyone said teachable. Yeah. I'm responsible. And they have all the same kind of language. It's like it was copy pasted on, from online somewhere. Mm -hmm. That is not how you want an application to be. I understand the need to submit the resume. It gave me the important data it gave me is their work experience. That's all I care about. I don't yeah. care about that first paragraph that tells me all about them. It's too professional. It's too right. refined. It's not the real person. So you need to make your application so unique that it brings out the person. For starters, the candor of the application uh, really caught me off guard a little bit because I could tell what kind of person G.O.D. was looking for. I could tell they were looking for a real human being that could change and grow with the organization and not just another cog in the wheel. Right. So I, it really made me feel good about the organization's mission and the direction that we were going in. Step number six, you need to get to know their IQ and their emotional intelligence, their EQ. IQ, their logic, their intelligence, and their EQ, their relatability, their ability to read people and relate to them. Now we did this in two ways. First, we had a question that says this, tell us a story about a rock. You may only say it in five sentences, make it as interesting as you can. So we had a lot of time, fun time, reading about rocks. And a lot of them, about half of them, turned into a story ending with the rock, Dwayne, Dwayne Johnson. Johnson. <laughs> <laughs> I've never seen Dwayne Johnson more in an application of my life. It was super funny. Those stories were really cool. Some of them were super creative. Some of them were like, eh, okay. They were you very know, plain. I right? think, yeah, <laughs> they were really plain. Like, come on. And the reason we picked something so plain is to test their creativity with right. that rock. To see how they can change it and make it colorful. Right. Creativity is important. On the other side, we asked a bunch of logic questions. Intermediate level of difficulty. You couldn't just look at it and know the answer unless you're super brilliant. You'd have to get out and do a little math to figure it out. I'm sure peop some people Googled that too, Yeah, unfortunately. But still, if they took the time to Google it, it tells me that they are decent at doing the work to get the answer. Let me give you an example. You have someone, they approach you, you need them to edit something in Photoshop. They don't know Photoshop. Well, they go figure it out. They figure it out, they find a way, and they get it done. You see? The logic and the creative writing portion was really refreshing because it's not your run of the mill, who are you, what can you do for me, you know, what have you done question. It's really asking, like, asking you to work your brain because a lot of times people know how to go, put on a good face. They know what you're going to ask yeah. and that kind of throws it off. But at the same time, it was a little bit fun. So I enjoyed that part. At the beginning of this video, we promised you some bonus tips, stuff that a lot of employers are not talking about. And we're going to share some of those tips with you guys as you try to hire someone. Tip number one, you want people who share what they really think. People on your team are afraid to tell you the truth or what they really feel. That means they either fear you or they're afraid of you or they're worried about you know being compromised somehow. They don't trust you. It is your job as a leader to make sure people are comfortable sharing what they feel. Now, it doesn't mean every time they have any possible disagreement, they always share what they think. That would be ridiculous and not that would hurt productivity. But I mean, if you're about to make a decision, you want them to share what they think if it's the appropriate level of the position. If they're just taking phone calls and you're making a decision about your finances, of course they shouldn't be sharing. But if they take phone calls and you're talking about a strategy for phone calls, you need to hear their opinion. Second, however, if they take offense when you disagree with them or someone else, they're not good for you. People who get easily offended when someone disagrees with them do not have the self confidence and sec emotional security needed to grow with a company. So it's very important that not only, not only do they share what they believe, but they are comfortable being disagreed with. Third, if that happens, and, so, and let's say, you know, Bobby McGee says A, Josiah says B, and Susie says C, and we decide to go with Susie's way, Josiah and Bobby are not offended in any way that we went that way. They're able to get behind the leadership and follow it strongly and support it. Right. It's not personal. So guys, there's a balance. We want people who are followers and follow the leadership, but at the same time, we want people who present their own opinion because we we need other people's opinion. We value people's opinion. Yeah. Leaders need the input of other people. Now, let me go back to the filters. First, there's a welcome, there's an invitation email. That's a filter. Second, there's an application they fill out. Third, once they fill out the application, there's an interview with us. Number four, they interview with coaches. Number five, there's one more phone interview in most cases. That's five filters. So what happens, you have a lot of people look at it, but some apply. Then they apply. Then those a lot of people, those get removed. Then there's a few that get interviews. Then a few more interviews with coaches or other staff 
because other people in your team are going to see things you don't. And then finally, there's that potential final phone interview if you think it's necessary. In that final phone interview, I ask a very difficult question. I say this, what if someone on the team, as in a member, a client, or a coach or a staff, starts trash talking myself, Josiah, or another staff member or coach, what do you do? Not a comfortable question. And to get their response is very important. They need to go to you, the leader, directly. You need to tell us. And I will go back to the person if needed. I won't even mention you told me. I'll just say, I'm aware that this is happening. Tell me what's going on. We assume the best, but we always need to know the bad news first. You want an employee who is not afraid to share the bad news. Not a snitch looking to tell on people to get good points with the boss, that's bad. But someone who actually goes out and is honest and protects the company. You need loyalty. If they are not loyal to you, it will hurt you in the long run and can put you in a very bad place. So make sure you train them. And in addition to that, make sure they know exactly what's expected. We spent so many hours writing the documentation to train we have workflows for every part of our company. How are videos? What's the workflow for that? Right. What is the workflow for communication? What is the ver workflow for marketing? What is the workflow for clients when they have a problem with their account? Anything. A workflow means a step-by-step -step process for everything that needs to be done, and your employees need to know exactly what's expected of them. Now, of course, you can't prepare them for everything, and they need to be okay with that and understand they're going to learn as they go. Right. Have clear workflows. Have clear training. They need to know who they report to. Make it very clear so they know who they answer to, who is their boss. Don't be afraid of the word boss. There's nothing wrong with it. Make them call you boss. I'm just joking. To add to that, an example of the documentation is we wrote, we probably spent over 15 hours just writing documentation and responses for different emails and organizing it in a way so that if a prospect, which is someone who's not a Just One Night member or a member asks a question, and you know it's usually a common question, then the person that we've hired knows how to respond to that question. And obviously they don't just copy, paste, and send, but it's a template so that based on the member, where they're at, or the prospect, and where they're at, who their name is, you know, how many emails you sent in the past, they can customize it, and then they can quickly respond to that email. Another important thing that you need to have in the people you hire is accountability, because without yep. accountability, you don't know what they're doing. For us, what we've done is we've writ written out a list of one-time tasks and recurring tasks for the people that work for us, so that we can know exactly where they're at with each task and how long they're spending on each task. So it can say, you know, in progress, not completed yet and completed. And that way we can see how often they're completing tasks so that we can see the amount of work they've done. We use project management software like Notion or Trello in order to hold it accountable and to be on the same page. That's really, really important. Well guys, if all else fails, then you should just hire this guy. This is Dakota, he is the Just One Night mascot, and he just wanted to say, hey everybody, how's it going? He wants to know if you got a retreat for him. You asked, and you you received, so at first ask, there's uh, there's nothing wrong. If you don't ask, you, you will never receive, and it's, it's even the same for me, uh, like, now I regret why I didn't ask you, because I really wanted even t the part-time job, and I didn't uh, I didn't ask for it, and it, uh, so opportunities can go away, and it could come one in, once in a lifetime, so for me, it would be like, oh, I see this job offer, and then it would be gone, and the second thing for, hi for hiring, which is, uh, I think, um, a hire based on intentions and skills of course skills but if you have people with skills choose the one with uh, the one who who has who who is more on the same frequency as uh, as your own uh, thoughts as your own uh, waves and with this these people will work for you they will work with you and in the same time they will not leave anymore they, they, because they choose they choose to be here i think that my number one is look for real people don't look for just the, the link in your chain i need somebody that's good at computer tasks and you just pick the first person that's good at computer tasks look for a real person because if you put rigidity into it that's what you're going to get out of it you're not going to get someone that's willing to ebb and flow and change as you know their dis job description changes and they're going to be right there for however long you let them be right there yeah. um and they won't be able to you know move with the company 
Um, also, it's okay to feel good about a candidate. I, I know in my interview, I got the feeling that I, I had a good feeling. Um, and I, I don't think that's a bad thing. Um, also, ask unusual questions. Because, like I said earlier, people know how to put on a good interview face. Yeah. They know what you're going to ask. So when you ask a question that just completely takes them off, they all they have to think about it, but at the same time, they have to search a little bit yeah. um, and really come up with something that is, you know, positive and is that poised. Yeah. Um, and then last, it kind of goes into what I said, try to structure the interview where you find the sweet spot between being relaxed and staunch interview procedure because that's when you're really going to find your best people. Not everybody has the ability to keep it together while people are stone-faced looking at them, but at the same time, you don't want to be too friendly. So I think it's a it's a delicate balance between finding, you know, being too rigid and too... This girl who always bakes a cake and for some reason she, she with cake or pie, she splits it in half. And she, you know, she's been doing that for a long time. And then finally someone asked her like, so why are you splitting this in half and you baking it like two separate halves at a time? And then she starts thinking and she says, well, the reason I do that is because my grandmother used to do that. Well, why did your grandmother used to do that? So she starts researching and then she finds out that her oven was just too small and she couldn't fit the whole, the whole pie at the same time. So that kind of, you know, it's like someone has created the method a long time ago. It may have been fitting for them at that time for what they needed, but that doesn't mean that you have to do the exact same thing. Just change it, you know, make it fit to your needs and um, and just uh, get creative. I hope this has been really helpful to you. Josiah, thanks for being here today, man. I appreciate it. Click on the link below. You can have the entire application and use it as a template for when you're hiring if that's helpful for you. You guys keep going, keep crushing out there, and we'll see you later. Bye. Bye. Um, so guys, when we sent out the uh, email, we... Start over. Sorry, I did a funny face. Uh, let me... He lost it. Okay. So guys, when we... S <laughs> <laughs> okay, okay. <laughs> okay.